back in the 80s when uh, Red Rockets were on tour, and I believe it was either uh, the Go-Go's or, uh, no, I think it was Men at Work, but um, the long story short was they had uh, taken a big circle of the original floor of the old Ryman Theater mm. stage and had put it to, they had uh, built this huge amusement park just north of uh, Nashville. And they had basically, they were televising and had moved all the productions out to the, to the amusement park. Um, and they had built a big theater in which they now call the Grand Ole Opry. Mm -hmm. And this is when the, uh, back in the eighties, they had kind of shut down the Ryman. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember what the cause was. It was just old or whatever. Uh, maybe it wasn't drawn in enough attendance. Uh, mm -hmm. Like it used to be. they just wanted to go out where they could bring more people in. But right. the long story, they had cut out this big circle where the, the center of the stage was, and they had moved it out and implanted it into the new stage. So you could clearly walk out on stage. You could see where the old stage had been centered. Yeah. And Mike was right there in the middle of it. And uh, I just, uh, Darren had mentioned to us, he had posted something the other day on Facebook uh, about the replacement of that, uh, an article on the replacing of that circle into the implanted new stage. And it dawned on me. I remember calling my mom after the, after the concert <laughs> and on the payphone backstage, a payphone. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and I just said, Ma, I, I was kind of cheered up because I know she would be super proud that, you know, because I grew up on the Grand Ole Opry on the radio. And <clears throat> I called her and told her, you know, I guess, guess what I just did? I just played the Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> truly did, you know, when you're sitting, you, you're on the center, on that little circle, that's the original stage. You could, I, I, I don't want to be weird about, you know, about it, but you do feel a magic. There is something poignant about being in that little circle uh, and all the people that have stood there before you. Uh, it, it has a lot of weight, a lot of weight. Yeah. Yeah. No, because I, I remember, I remember seeing stories about when they moved it to whatever building in Nashville it's in now. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and I thought that was a really cool idea, you know, where it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not tossing away the history so lightly kind of thing. And, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. And there's just something about that circle of boards where it's like you 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 know know all the all the greats have have stepped there at one point in time yeah just think hank williams you know dolly parton's uh mini pearl uh <laughs> you know you name them they all about roy acuff they've all uh stood in that spot and uh i'm, I'm actually now in my hindsight i'm so, so grateful that i got that opportunity to, to stand there hmm. in, in the proper circle and uh, yeah did your mom get emotional when you, she told um, you? Yeah. My mom was never, <laughs> she never really would uh, show emotion too much. I mean, she was like, she'd be more like, well, good for you, son. You're right. you know? <laughs> you said it, yeah. Okay. Have a good night. See you. Click. <laughs> you know? no, no. My dad was really proud of the band and successes of the Red Rockers, you know, and they loved Cowboy Mouth too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they would come out and our sound checks in Memphis, you know, and come to the big shows. I remember, uh, I'll never forget, uh, we were doing sound, a kind of a sound line check, you know, at uh, Memphis in May, which is a big concert held down by Mud Island, but down in the lower part of the river. And uh, uh, Little Richard was on the bill that day and uh, later on in the evening. Well, my mom and dad came out to watch us do our sound check and our show. And my mom was just sitting in a little lawn chair next to our trailer outside. And it was all, uh, it was kind of a muddy grassy area. So they had these, uh, uh, what do you, uh, the pallets, you know, wooden mm -hmm. pallets lined up that you could watch walkways. And she was sitting by one of those. And little Richard, uh, I'd come off the stage for, from the sound check. And I walked up to my mom and I saw her talking to uh, this gentleman, and I was like, I'm, I, I didn't dawn on me at the time. And I, she goes, I said, Ma, do you know? She, I was still sitting there talking to my mom <laughs> so, as I'm walking down the plank. And then he just kind of went back and did his own thing and went away. And I, I, I asked my mom, Mom, do you know who that is? She's like, No. <laughs> 
that's little Richard. Okay. <laughs> uh, I said, well, what was he saying to you? Oh, he was the nicest man. <laughs> he was so nice and so sweet. He was like asking where I was from and what I was doing and who, well, whatever, and just, just casual conversation. And I remember he had curlers in his hair. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, I guess a rap, oh, you, know, you know, you see ladies in the mm-hmm. 50s and 60s, um, curlers, and I, I just thought that was truly amazing. She had no clue. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <At all. laughs> yeah, no, I, I wonder how often those kind of things happen where, you know, someone brushes up against someone that others would kill to have a conversation with, and they just, eh, just yeah, just another well, person. Uh, well, he wasn't so little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember saying that. Yeah, he wasn't too little. Uh, anyway, yeah, my my parents were great. They really supported the music, my music, and uh, have always been really good. Uh, they they're long gone now, but um, they they were good. They loved they loved Fred. They just thought Fred was the bee's knees. <laughs> my mom used to call Fred the dumpling. <laughs> and that's a funny story too. Uh, uh, Steve Walters was in the band at the time, uh, bass player Paul Sanchez and I, and Fred, we would go to play in Memphis, and we would stay at my mom and dad's house out in Germantown, uh, and um, we'd wake up in the morning, and my dad would cook us breakfast and uh, bacon and eggs and whatever, and um, one day we were, uh, I think we'd come back after sound check to change clothes and just to kind of relax. And uh, we got back in the car and we're going back to the venue and we're waiting on Fred, mm-hmm. which happens a lot. But um, uh, my mom comes out to the, to the van and she's uh, hanging on the passenger side window inside the car. And she's, uh, Steve Walters is sitting there and I'm driving and Paul's in the back. And she goes, well, where's the dumpling? <laughs> we all just like bust out laughing. Like, are you talking about Fred? Right. <laughs> yeah, he's a dumpling. <laughs> yeah, uh, laugh. So uh, he's kind of proud of that that my mom labels the dump. The dump. Uh, yeah, definitely no G on the end of that one. No, yeah, ex- apostrophe. Yes, right. for sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they were good, good people. All right, and so they they never, you know. Like when you first embarked on this journey, and they never said, "Are you sure about this?" or "What the hell are you thinking?" Oh. or, "Of course, yeah." Oh, course. okay. You know, my dad was like, "You know, you should have gone to finance in college." You know, I, I went into music at LSU studying. I wanted to do what I, got, I still want to do is score film and TV music, and so I had that idea coming out of high school that that's kind of where I wanted to focus my direction. Um, so I got into LSU's and I, uh, LSU's music school um, by having to write a, court, uh, a quintet uh, piece uh, for uh, violas and two violins and a cello. Hmm. And I, I wrote this little piece and they liked it and I got into the music school and yada, yada, yada. And uh, I spent two years there and then I just, I dropped it because I got it into punk rock music. <laughs> and uh, that's that, that's where that kind of went, Zzz! Mm-hmm. So I turned it Albuquerque, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, uh, yeah. So it, my dad was uh, he was a little not happy about it because uh, you know uh, he thought he kind of thought I should go into something like finance, and I remember him always saying that you know you should have studied to be in, be a banker or a you know, financial guy. Mm-hmm. You know, hindsight you can't go in hindsight and, and and question it now. You know. Yeah. 40 years later, but, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm happy with the path I took. So, right. I'm and it sounds like they eventually came around to it. Yes. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> yeah. Once, once he saw the video of China on, on, on the TV, <laughs> he saw his son and all, all his, uh, I guess, faux sons. Cause he always, they always took us all in, you know, oh, okay. had, you know, Darren and James and, even Cowboy Mouth, you know, Fred and Steve and Paul, they, they basically adopted them, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and just showed, uh, uh, and when uh, my dad, I remember when he, when I'd come back to Germantown, 
to stay with them, they would take me to a restaurant. They loved this little Japanese, uh, Chinese restaurant called the Panda. And they would take us there, take me and my ex-wife, my wife at the time. Yeah. Uh, they had this lady that would go to the tables and she, you would pick a song out of the songbook, you know, the, the, this thick of like show tunes. They go, well, this is our son. He's on MTV, right. you know, <laughs> yeah, he's, you know, and uh, I was like, dad, no, no, <laughs> please, no. <laughs> She's not going to know, care. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you have those little embarrassing, semi-embarrassing moments. You know? Right, right. The pride. Yeah. Although that's that's funny. I don't think most people think about that, that the person who's on MTV is still having embarrassing moments with his parents. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. It happened quite a bit, you know. It's like... Uh, and you, when you least expect it, too, it's like you know you're you're with some folks you like down in Mississippi and, and someone oh yeah this is my you know at the courthouse you know trying to do something for your for the farm and yeah you know and you know oh, by the way this is my son John Thomas you know he's on MTV yeah. and then like <laughs> they all boasted you know, boasting and like uh, <laughs> uh, I, come on man are you kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So yeah, a lot of moments like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, ba back in the day when they did actually play music on MTV, was all of that stuff fun? Uh, you know, I thought, yeah, it, it was a blast, you know, uh, because we were kind of at the head start of it, you know, the beginning end of it. Uh, a lot of I've had a lot of people go, oh, yeah, you know, you guys were the first video or one of the first top 10 videos that be played that on that day, the first day, which isn't true. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it was probably a year or six months into its infancy at, at the beginning that we had uh, China had uh, like it, it dropped on the MTV. Yeah. Um, and that was a crazy story because that was all that was all done in New Orleans and it was all done on spec. And um there's a great bunch of guys that we knew that had a little production company that did local commercials. And they also had bands that we played with. They were all in bands. And so they came to us and said, hey, look, we like this song. And there's this new thing called MTV. And we were aware of it. And we were like, OK, well, let's let's sit. And we all sat and did storyboards and talked about what we we're going to do here. And I really planned it out. And uh, I think that's why it came off as well as it did and mm. um, we took that up to new york city and we played it uh i remember when al teller who was the uh the president of we were in his office and he heard the song for the first time and i just remember he didn't bat an eye he said this is going to be a hit i want all the guys in the field all the a and r guys out in the that start working hard and make this a hit and we were like okay cool I don't know what that means, but cool, you know, <laughs> but little did we know, uh, you know, it was, I remember the, um, the, when they first saw the video, they, they, th that's when it really it hit Al Teller. He said, Oh no, this is going to be, this is going to be really good. This is what we need for these guys. Hmm. You know, they need to be on MTV. That's the new medium and yeah. we're going to push the hell out of it. And we got in heavy rotation like five times, six times a day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, for about a year there, year and a half. And then, of course, we had subsequent uh, videos with uh, Eve Destruction and uh, Blood from a Stone. and uh, Yeah, and uh, I think it was one more. Oh, Good as Gold. Okay, okay. Uh, to, 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 anyway, um, I'll never forget, I was, uh, we had not really, it's just around the same time we would, uh, transferred all our business operations up to Missouri, where Darren had grown up as a kid. And uh, we were fit, we had finished the album, we had drove, driven from San Francisco, where we recorded it back to, to, uh, to St. Louis, or Mexico, Missouri, which is a little small town, farm town out by Columbia. And I never forget, we were driving, James Singletary and I were driving the van with all our gear in it back to New Orleans. And it was, uh, I don't know, like four or five in the afternoon. And we're crossing the river bridge, Mississippi River Bridge there in St. Louis and the arches on your 
your left there and turn on the radio, rolled one, <laughs> ready to smoke, turn on the radio. And it's, it, immediately, I mean, it wasn't like five seconds before we turned the radio on. I mean, we had turned the radio on. It, 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 you heard the... And we just like looked at each other and couldn't believe we were on the radio. Wow. Like, it's a 40 radio. Uh, it was the most amazing feeling. We were like, oh, shit. That was... <laughs> I mean, from the... From going from to Al, the day Alatella said that... Right. It was it more than like a couple weeks. Huh. And we were like, well, that's fast. Holy <laughs> man, these guys... You know? Um, so, yeah, they put them... When they, you know... When you listen to Pink Floyd's Have a Cigar. Yeah. And you hear about, you know, Welcome to the Machine. Yes. That's, that's it. Yeah. That's the, that's, it's, it's the feeling. Yeah. The cogs are rolling and it's starting to work and it's big time. And it, it's overwhelming, you know, for a young 21 year old, 22 year old kid, you know, 23. I just can't imagine. Some of these kids that go into you know Major League Baseball at 20 years old. Mm. That that's a lot of head heady stuff. Yeah. You know, play. but I, you just roll through it. And, you know, I always told I've always told Fred and, and Paul and uh, the rest of the band uh, when we were early on in Cal- Calvin Math in the early 90s and stuff, and we would meet somebody or we'd get on a tour or do something like that, and I'd always look at them and say. Well, if that's not happening, then you need to worry. Hmm. Because we're not touring with somebody like the Go Go's or something like that. And something's wrong. <laughs> that's just the way my attitude was. Yeah. Know? Um. Like we should be touring with. I mean, we're a good band. We should be. I mean, and you know, the lineup with Cowboy Mouth now is just it, it's super. It's I'm, I'm it's it, it's one of the awesomest. Our lineups we've ever had yeah i mean every you know totally driven and dedicated and um not that the the others were not but um i don't want to take any way thing away from paul or steve or or any of the bass players the uh 20 bass players we've had down through the years mm-hmm. but, <laughs> but uh yeah it's uh it's a really good combo you know and there's no reason why we shouldn't be um at the, the top of the game it's yeah. just uh, now it's just gonna be a little bit harder getting out of this covid strut this thing you know um nobody knows what's going to happen i mean yeah. we're, we're 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 kind of being told that probably won't be coming back until next summer would be before any i mean some people are trying to do the, the social distancing and they're having you know small crowds and right um just to, uh just to get out and be active. Um, that's the one thing you got to worry about is just kind of getting stale and rusty and, um, got to, you know, yeah. So that's my worry is, but that's the, I seem to think that we have a, you know, with the lineup with Matt and Brian and Fred and I, we can bust the dust off of it pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. Cause you guys are, are such professionals and, and have so many, hours logged <laughs> that I would think it would snap back pretty quickly. Yeah, it should. It should. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, <clears throat> just kind of stay in shape on your own. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, what kind of stuff do you, do you play nowadays when you pick up the guitar? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't bring a guitar with me to Alaska. So it's been several weeks since I've even touched a guitar. Wow. Um, was that intentional? Um, yeah, it was sort of, kind of. You know, we had a lot of stuff. We brought our dog with us, and uh, that kind of took the place of the guitar, so to speak. <laughs> you know, it really did. I mean, you can't uh, carry a guitar through an airport and a dog. It's, it's right. uh, <laughs> a challenge. It's a challenge. But um, it's uh, uh, not really intentional. I'm kind of glad to have the break and kind of just kind of hang you know and do something else for a change mm-hmm. i think the things I've, I've 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 from the outset i was like okay well i'm gonna try some different stuff i mean i'm trying to be a uh, uh i'm taking a, a course on trying to be a drone pilot a commercial pilot 
So that's one of the things I just figured I'll, I'll just concentrate on that until all this is over and we'll get back to school. We'll get back to work when, when the time is, comes. Um, but uh, nothing I can really do. I get to do live streams and um, I just, yeah, I've done, I did a little series called uh, JTG's Pandemic Fireside Sessions, which I have loaded up on a uh, YouTube channel. Right. And I did about 35 of those, uh, a series of about 35 songs. Um, and I just kind of dropped it for a while just because um, we started traveling. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's the only thing. I play piano a lot. You know, I, uh, I've been working on demos for a solo album. Uh, I've got enough. I've been working with Jonathan Priedis from, who used to be a little guitarist. Okay. And, uh, and just working by myself, you know, my studio. You know, am home. Yeah. You know, I've got a good collection of probably 12, 15 songs that, that uh, I'm, I'm easily put together a solo album in a, in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. so, um, and, you know, in Cowling Mouth is looking to do maybe some mm -hmm. uh, some singles uh, mm -hmm. over the six months until we get out of this COVID. Right. Yeah. And then when you write a song, I mean, do you consciously think, oh, this is a Cowboy Mouth song or this is a solo tune? And is there uh, a difference in your mind between the two? Um, I just wait till see what happens with the band. I present it to the band first. And if it, if they, if it doesn't make the grade or whatever, for whatever reason, uh, I, I'll just, just, it'll just go into the solo pile mm -hmm. immediately. And uh, yeah. I just uh, really started writing a, a slew of songs over the last six months, especially when it sets this COVID thing, because that's all you really have time to do. Mm. Not much else to you can do. Uh, so yeah, uh, and we're talk we've been sharing ideas back and forth. You know, Matt's been writing, Fred's been writing. He's got a bunch of new old songs, new songs. Um, we've talked about taking some of our older solo stuff and redoing those with the new with the new. Uh, lineup yeah i don't say new it's kind of old and matt's been with us for like 12 years now 10 years or something like that and um it's for about five or six i think um something like that yeah so it's, it, i say new i shouldn't say that <laughs> uh, maybe the existing lineup i should say yeah yeah, well, I mean, it's kind of like the George Carlin joke about, you know, calling it the New Testament, you know. He's like, the book is 2,000 years old. <laughs> yeah, I, I love his, his take on religion. It's, it's pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and well, you mentioned, you know, uh, playing piano. I was always curious, did learning piano, playing piano, did that influence you as a guitar player? Uh, it helps. And, uh, funny you should bring that up because I, I do talk to people, uh, will text me and go, Hey, I'm looking at this piano for my kids. Um, what do you think? Um, uh, or a guitar. And I'll say, well, in, in my view, I find that if you teach your children piano first and the theory guitar and every other instrument will just come secondhand. Hmm. I, I truly believe that. I don't. I don't think I would pick up. I picked up guitar as easily as I did if I had not had training in piano for thirteen years, from the age of seven till I was like fourteen or fifteen. I stopped taking classical mm -hmm. piano lessons, um, and I stopped picked up the guitar, and it became very easy. I don't know why. I don't. I like to attribute it to learning piano. Mm -hmm. No and chord changes and structures and melody and things like that you learn from piano i remember my dad once told me i'll never forget this i had i guess i was being a, a uh probably a stuck up kid or whatever you know, <laughs> inside but um i i remember uh i didn't want to practice or something like one day and he said son you're going to realize one day, you're going to realize how lucky you are to have, to have lessons and you are fortunate to, to take lessons and yada, yada, yada. And because you're going to be sitting around one day by yourself and you're going to be able to play to yourself. 
and you're going to appreciate this, what I'm telling you right now. And, you know, of course, in hindsight, you know, 34 years later, <laughs> yeah, whatever, and they're playing piano and it hits you. He was right. Mm. Oh, I really enjoyed just sitting there by myself, making up melodies and stuff, you know, for film or TV and, mm -hmm. you know, just, just having, you know, it's relaxing. It's, uh, you know, it, and the fact that you can just sit down and do that, he was he was truly right. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it. So you don't realize those things when you're a kid. Yeah. You know, you're just thinking, just yelling at you. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> go. I want to go play baseball. Right. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it also speaks to, you know, your style of playing, uh, which, like Matt always describes, is you have a very soulful style of playing guitar. And, you know, I, I've noticed, you know, like with those words. <laughs> Thank you. I know. But, you know, li listening to, you know, it'd be a Cowboy Mouse stuff where I was going through uh, your, your solo album, Aluminum, earlier today, you know, listening to, to songs from that. You know, I noticed you know, one thing that sticks out is you're not about speed. You're not about all these uh, fretboard gymnastics, uh, or, 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 or things of that nature, um, that, that so many, I don't know, people seem drawn to, or to try and, uh, um, learn to impress others. Were you ever drawn to that or was it just never your thing? Uh, I was never really drawn to it. Um, <clears throat> uh, I grew up with classic rock, uh, with Jimmy Page. Uh, was one of my big heroes, uh, Billy Gibbons, mm -hmm. ZC, uh, you know, um, uh, David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. Um, they, there was always, and, and then, and of course, the songwriting aspect really, uh, I think had a big thing to do with it, had a lot to do with it because there, when you're, I, I wanted, when I write parts on guitar, I want them to means something it's not like a a weedly deedly like a real fast lick or anything just to show off yeah uh, or prowess i think my prowess lies in the, the structure of the song and the, what i kind of learned from jimmy page or taken from his book is uh orchestration and that's kind of what i got out of the film my classes at lsu was orchestration and counterpoint and harmony mm. and how they all work Together. And I think that's where that comes from. I don't think it's uh, um, and I, I've never really thought of myself as a proficient enough guitar player to do that stuff. I, I, I always admired blues guitar players. And that's kind of what I, if I had to label myself as a, a guitar player, I'd label myself as a blues rock guitar player. Mm -hmm. If anything, just blues. Uh, I really loved Keith Richards when I was growing up. I, I, I liked him. I, you know, it's funny. I, I liked him. I realized that now that I loved Keith Richards because of his lifestyle. I loved <laughs> Keith Gilmore because he was so tasty and so mm -hmm. precise and didn't. And, and the one thing that I learned of David Gilmore was less is more. Yeah. And the, the, that's where I come from less is more department because uh and, and billy gibbons is the same way he doesn't have to shred to prove his point mm -hmm. you know? so that's kind of where that comes from i never thought of myself as a real big guitar player. i don't even remember telling fred when uh when he first put in this band together cowboy now um i played most of the leads and and stuff and recordings and uh, you know, with, with red rockers uh, nobody else really could or would until we got Sean Paddock uh, in the band, who was a really proficient guitar player, could play anything. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I told Fred, you know, he called me up one day and he said, hey, you know, you want to come play in this band? I'm starting. Uh, we didn't have a name at the time. There was mm -hmm. no name. It was just with Paul Sanchez and I and, and, uh, and another bass player at the time that I knew. We were all friends. We all knew each other and we had uh, Paul and I had already been doing Lonesome Travelers at this time. Mm. Um, we had started Lonesome Travelers about a year or six months before Cowboy Mouth even had their first rehearsal. 
Okay. So Paul and I were well acquainted with our, with each other, and I knew Fred from da- uh, from Dash Rip Rock and from uh, both of the guys from Backbeats, which we had done gigs together in New Orleans back in our early twenties. Well, Fred had called me and said, "Hey, you know, we need a lead guitarist. We're kind of sneaking up the joint over here. Do you come, can you think you come in and 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 help us out?" And uh, I was like, told, I remember telling Fred, I said, Fred, I'm not a lead guitar player, uh, and, but I will do my best and I will try to figure it out if you want, if that's what you need. And I just said, okay, I need to go back and start brushing up on how to be a lead guitar player. I didn't ever, I'd never really thought of myself as one because mm-hmm. I was a single songwriter, mm-hmm. you know, that, that kind of more was my focus Yeah. and uh, at that time, because I had left Red Rockers and I was doing my own thing in New Orleans and just playing around town as an acoustic singer songwriter. Uh, and that was it. You know, that's how I became a lead guitar player. Yeah. Kind of sit down and, and make it work. Although we, another thing that interests me about your style is that, you know, uh, you know, you, you, you grew up in New Orleans, you know, during your formative years. And yet to me, you don't, as eclectic as New Orleans is, you don't sound like necessarily a New Orleans musician, you know? Uh, um, your writing style, your playing style, to me, it just sounds a little bit more dusty, a little bit more Southwest, Southern California kind of uh, uh, thing. Um, you know. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and certainly not to knock New Orleans stuff, but I just, I thought, you know, I was listening again, you know, to your stuff and I'm like, wow, you know, I, had I not known, I wouldn't have guessed you came out of New Orleans. And I'm wondering if you can hear a New Orleans influence in your style. Uh, not necessarily because, um, you know, I, I grew up all over the country. I'm from Texas originally. Um, and, uh, I've lived in so Southern California as a kid, and I, I you know, um, you know, the great thing I, I got really, I've been very fortunate, and I, I'm very grateful that my dad moved us around the country as much as he did, because it gave, it gives me a lot of, in hindsight, it gives me a lot of uh, insight to where I, my music kind of came from or how it developed, and that is, you know, 1968, I moved to Fullerton, California. And my dad bought me a little transistor radio, one of the Radio Shack ones, and had FM. And I remember sitting it in the window the first time I got it and turned it on, turned it on the station, and found a station. And the first thing I heard was Jimi Hendrix, uh, uh, Foxy Lady. No. And I was like, whoa, what is that? And of course, then, you know, the next thing that comes on is probably uh, Good Times, Bad Times, you know, mm-hmm. by Led Zeppelin. On down the line, Deep Purple, you know, everybody, you know, uh, Cream, you know, yeah. and I, and started really absorbing that, you know, I guess when you're eight or t- between that eight and 12 year old range, you really ab- start absorbing the music. You don't know really what, how it's done or whatever until you get older and then you start getting curious. Well, how was that recorded? Hmm. Who, who, who did that? Who produced this? And that's what's kind of missing with the, with LPs and stuff like that from that era, is that you could read the credits and you could see who played what and what. And you start seeing some of the similar names start popping up on some of these records and stuff. Um, and I uh, moved to New Jersey uh, in 1973. And all the kids there, of course, I was in like uh, eighth, seventh, eighth, tenth, ninth, tenth grade. By the time I was in tenth grade, kids were starting to play music like form little bit putt putt bands, yeah. you know, you know, um, and the kids up there in New Jersey were really into like the nitty gritty dirt band, <laughs> uh, John Hartford, uh, all these, uh, you know, um, country kind of grateful dead, you know, mm. uh, just kind of borderline rock bands, new writers of the purple sage. Um, and, uh, my first, the inclination was, wait, these kids are not from the South. What do they know about country music? <laughs> so I was like, um, uh, I got a banjo and I started to learn. I had a banjo teacher and I started to learn how to play banjo. Uh, you know, play, started picking up the acoustic guitar and playing guitar more than piano. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, yeah, uh, I moved to New Orleans, and it wasn't until years later, after I was even out of the Red Rockets, that I realized that I was being set. When I got to New Orleans, it all made sense. Because I remember being in New Jersey and hearing like the right place, wrong time on the radio. Mm-hmm. And uh, from Dr. John, you know, a lot of crazy song, but I had no idea he was from New Orleans. Yeah. Because the DJ would never announce that. The like, guys oh, that Dr. John, you know, or you know, they just go on to the next song. Yeah. And so you you realize when you get down there, oh, wait, I, I remember this. That fat Domino. Yeah. Okay. He's from here? You kidding me? <laughs> He lives in the ninth ward? No way! You know, <laughs> these realizations start hitting you. And, you know, I, I remember my f- first cassette. My dad had bought me a little Craig tabletop cassette player. Mm-hmm. And he took it to a little record store and he said, pick any cassette out. And my first cassette was Green River by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Oh. And I thought they were from Louisiana. I would totally have guessed that as well. I, I, for years, little did I know they were from the Northwest. I had no idea. I, yeah. You know, so, yeah. So, you know, you, you can, yeah. So I had a lot of that going on when I was growing up. You know, those moments, epiphanies, you know, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Uh, New Orleans, I never didn't think, you know, that my extent to New Orleans music was probably like Robert Palmer, you know, playing with the meters. And I didn't even know who the meters were. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I moved. Yeah. But you're, get, you're, you're getting this influence from places that you, you just think, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know what you think. You just, you just absorb it and it's, oh, I like the song. I don't know where they're from. But you don't really, it doesn't really matter when you're a teenager. Yeah. Like, or uh, yeah. I don't know, at least in the era we grew up in. You know, a I I absorbed like I, I still absorb like every bit of liner notes I can get my hands on with 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 any album, and but also part of that is is checking out interviews. And I remember one thing that led me to people I would not have heard is you know you clue in with a particular band or musician, and then they mentioned, oh yeah, you know I kind of picked that up from this artist, or you know who really interests me influenced me was this guy, and I'm like, oh well. I don't know who that is, but I'm going to go check him out now, you know. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I'm pretty influenced by classic rock in the uh, 60s and 70s, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, from David Bowie to T-Rex to Creedence Clearwater to Zeppelin to Deep Purple, you, know, you name it. Uh, Beatles, yeah. Stones. Um, I've got a new song that, I, uh, that I've just written. It's called uh, uh, Do You Feel All Right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's straight up stones. Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it, it, you can't deny it. I, I, I'll wear it on my sleeve as much as the, uh, my, uh, my influence is on my sleeve as much as possible. Now. Uh, it's a good tip of the hat to them and, and to that genre. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, it's, it's fun. Yes. And you, you, you know, it's funny when I write songs and stuff, I don't realize it until it's in hindsight that, oh, I know that. I kind of have an idea with that. I'm not going to tell anybody. Right. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, I know in my mind where that comes from deep inside. You know, uh, yeah. And then how about your singing? How has your voice evolved over the years? Uh, it, it's gotten, well, I think it's gotten better because when I was in the Red Rockers, we really didn't. Uh, I was, when we formed the band, nobody else could sing. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, you know, I sang in church choir and I had a really great church choir director that helped me learn how to read and music and, and sing properly. But once I got in Red Rockers, the, uh, you, all that got kind of thrown out the window mm. because, you know, you're listening to, and you're trying to mimic like Joe Strummer and Johnny Lydon and, um, you know, the punk rock bands, that, you know, we were listening to, and it, which was influencing us at the time. Um, and I was, you know, and then you start kind of drinking and smoking and caffeine. And those three, those, those three right there are, are the, the three strikes you're out thing for your voice. Mm-hmm. Because you, yeah. So uh, after years of that, um, I, uh, 
I went and had a, my, I remember we were, it was like 1996 and the band had been playing religiously every weekend. Bam, 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 and no time off. And I developed polyps on my throat oh. from my vocal cords. And I went to see an ENT and uh, they said, well, we're going to have to uh, zap, zap them off with a laser and then let them heal. But you're not going to be able to sing or anything for a few weeks, for three, two or three weeks. And it just so happened that I, it, very luckily, we took two weeks off during, I think, Easter break. It was the first two weekends we had taken off in six years. Mm. Cowboy Mountain. And uh, I just said, well, I'm just going to ride out to California and see my cousins and see my family and uh, visit an old girlfriend, yada, yada, yada. I took it as a soul searching mission. I just said, bought a new car. So I drove from New Orleans all the way to Los Angeles. And um, along the way, I listened to Vince Gill's Pocket Full of Gold album hmm. the entire way and back. And I remember just saying to myself, this is what I want to sound like. Hmm. This is what I want to be like. I want to be able to hear the high lonesome. I want to be able to be pure, you know, in my voice. And, and so I resolution right there was like, we're cutting out all that crap. Gone. Mm -hmm. Done. We're not going to, you know, the, the doctor tells you it's smoking a joint down to the nub the heat well first of all the heat is so powerful it scars your tissue mm. then you drink in a jägermeister follow that with a beer alcohol dehydrates you mm. then you wake up in the morning you drink coffee all morning and that's another uh, diuretic so you gotta you, you're you're tripling up your your downside you know it's yeah. not good so I vowed to, to be that, and uh, I remember um, just listening to that album, and it really had a big impact on me because I just loved his voice. I wanted to sing like that. I just made a commitment to, to quit everything and, uh, and commit to being a better singer. Hmm. You know? Um, yeah. You know, most of the time, I don't think uh, sometimes people realize, but you know, uh, I'm singing the entire show with Cowboy Mouth because I'm singing all the harmonies with Fred. Right. That's way that's way up there on the scale. You know, and it's it's uh, you got to be in shape. It's not for the faint of heart. Right. Right. No, I. So, yeah, and especially to you know in a rock show where. Um, right. You've got a you lot know, of. You've you got, got a, a lot of distractions right. going around you. You can't right. you know, any. But it's not working right. The monitor is not working right. The sound guy stinks. Just, uh, you know, it's too loud. <laughs> just piles on. You yeah. Know, so you got to. Yeah. You know, Vince Vince Gill shows. They you know they tend to quiet down and like okay we're gonna you know just sit and be quiet and to hear him sing and everything. But you know, Cowboy Mouse shows. Yeah. Still from Cowboy Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I gotta say, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm 60 years old now, and um, uh, I've lost a lot of my hearing, which mm. uh, thinks, but that's what happens with old age and getting older. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, we Fred and I we, we do these acoustic shows uh, now, like what Fall and I used to do the Lonesome Travelers Living Room concert series. Is. Yeah, and. Um, uh, it, they're, they're, they've grown since we first started doing them to a really beautiful thing with Fred. Um, I like to think that he's kind of, he, he's pulled back a little bit and let the harmonies blossom. Mm. And uh, so these events that we do, these little living room concerts, have taken on a really beautiful uh, essence, I should say. Because mm -hmm. When you sing softer and you sing, you know, and you really blend well, which we do, uh, I think, um, yeah, it becomes a really beautiful thing. Hmm. And has it, has it kind of given you a, a renewed appreciation for some songs? No doubt about it, Chris. There's no doubt about it. Because I, uh, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but uh, some back 
in the 2000s, Fred and I decided to go do a little solo tour together where I would open for him and vice versa. And we did like four or five dates through the Carolinas and Atlanta. And uh, I remember we'd gotten to Isle of Palms and uh, we had, um, uh, I had gone on first and I used to just kind of do my acoustic shows kind of willy nilly, I should say. It, mm. it wasn't much organization. Just get up and feel what the audience and feel whatever you feel like playing, you'll be fine. And it's, it's kind of a lazy man's way to do it. Um, uh, and I watched Fred that night and I had realized uh, after the first couple of days, you know, I love the way he takes his songs like easy. Let's take that for example. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he just strums it with with a ba with that abandon, you know, ding, 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 ding. and all of a sudden, and, uh, and a lot of his other songs he had kind of done in different styles, and uh, I guess so to speak, just a little off, you know, a little bit made it a little more interesting. I went back to my hotel room that night, and I stripped down. I took like twenty songs, and I just stripped them all down to see. How can I play this? How can I play this differently? How can I do this differently and make it a little interesting? Mm. Even for myself, if not anybody else. And i uh, that's kind of where Apples and Onions grew out of. Because all those songs, you know, you have uh, Man on the Run, uh, yeah. I Know It Shows, um, a couple others, uh, Follow Me, and I just, uh, on that album, came out of that, that's those those live sessions I did with Fred. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it gave me a greater appreciation back to your question. It did make me appreciate that the songs were, I don't want to toot my own horn, but they were well enough written to where they could take on the, that transformation and still be poignant. Yeah. And the, the case in point is Man on the Road. I mean, when I, when I, when I finger picked that version acoustically, to me, it brings out even more the stark loneliness of the song, of being alone in the desert by yourself with your, you know, your thoughts. You're, you're, you're driving. You're on, you're, you know, ten hours to get to San Antonio to Los Cruces. You know, whatever. Yeah. And you've, you've got so much time on your hands to think about where you've been, what you're doing, uh, who you are, why is the where's when, why and how and how, whatever. Yeah. And, really uh uh and that that and, uh, and and what i told you before about the the vince gill inspiration led to apples and onions and i really wanted to be able to pull that off so yeah it, it, it's nice to have both versions you have the cowboy mouth rock version and then which is really uplifting and and then you've got the version which makes you feel like wow i feel lonely yeah <laughs> Right. I'm all alone out here, and I can sense, you know, sense the uh, sense sense all that stuff. It's it's weird, but it, it, I I always like to tell myself, well, that's a sign of a, a, a decent written song, because if you can pull it off both ways and it can still hold its own, then it's uh, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You know, I mean, it's it's and it's you know because I came to it from cowboy mouth first and then the apples and onions version and you know i would wonder what it would be like to go the other way someone who had just heard the apples and onions version and then hears you know the the full-on rocker from from are you with me um you know I, I don't i don't know if you're familiar with some of the later red rocker stuff from uh schizophrenic circus but um we uh we covered uh, a couple songs off that record uh, from different that were brought to us to the studio, and one of them was a song called "Shades of 45. Mm -hmm. It was basically uh, reminiscing about the whole, uh, not, not you know, nuclear, whatever, back from the 40s, you know, with the A bomb and stuff yeah. like that, and how it, now today with the proliferation of nuclear warheads and Russian American. Uh, this guy from Canada had written this song called Shades of 45. Now, his version that we originally listened to was nothing but synthesizer. Hmm. So we had to take that synthesized version and make it into a Red Rockers version, mm -hmm. which is the one that you hear on the Schizophrenic Circus record. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't our song, but 
still again the, the what you brought up about taking a song that's kind of low key and then putting it into high gear is a, that's a great example. Right. The other one that that pops to mind is uh, I don't know if you remember, but in in like mid nineties there was a, a Kiss tribute album where all these different artists did uh, Kiss songs and. Mostly it was all kind of in that same vein as the originals, except there was um, Toad the Wet Sprocket did uh, Rock and Roll All Night. Um, really? Yeah. And they completely slowed it down and mellowed it. And I know, like, when it came out, there were so many people that hated that version. But I'm like, you know what? I really like this version. I really... Yeah. I mean, they made it this sad, melancholy piece, but... Yeah, it, well, you know building, what, that, on, building on what you said, I think actually it's it's quite the compliment that yeah this this song can be uh, used in different ways and can be interpreted in different ways and it still works. Right, I agree, I agree, and, and you know, great, great hats off to them for for taking on. I think that was the appropriate way to go about that. I I, I, I agree with them. You know, doing a song like that and doing it in a totally different way, interpret it uh, totally not what you would expect. Um, yeah. And there lies the surprise, you know. Yeah. And because I've heard that a lot from other artists lately. It's like, all right, if you're going to cover a song in a show, it's fine to make it sound just like whatever the original was because that's it's a whole different vibe. If you're going to go to the process of recording a song, a cover song, you really should try and take it in a new direction um because otherwise why not just listen to the original you know yeah you know um cowboy mouth we did a song for uh the movie half baked with um uh uh with david chappelle and with jim brewer okay i don't know if it was a movie it was kind of a, a weed movie whatever you want to call it. weeds and um yeah we had a danny korchmar from uh come in and, and, and produce a track called the pusher man from steppenwolf and uh, i i we should i it would be great to find that that, that version it's, it's kind of interesting with fred singing it hmm. you know okay but yeah i have to I have to look that up and find that and see if we could post that on the on the facebook page it's somewhere out there i know fred's <laughs> got it somewhere yeah i don't doubt it yeah yeah and then, you know, you, you talk about all this, you know, uh, um, things that have happened to you while you were, you know, let's say on that long road from from San Antonio heading west, the I-10, um, and all of this uh, uh, wandering or, or moving that your family did when you were younger. And then in recent years, I know you've been doing a lot of international traveling mm -hmm. and... It seems like, I mean, because, you know, the average musician, once he gets off the road, does not want to move <laughs> or go, go anywhere outside of like a two block radius. Um, and yet you go farther than than you do even when you're on the road. So I'm curious, what what do you get from traveling that just seems to energize you or feed you? Uh, I... Well, first of all, I've got a fantastic girlfriend, um, Kim Randall, who uh, facilitates most of the travel for us. Um, uh, and uh, we've gone to some amazing places. I've gotten to play in Japan, which was always a dream of mine. Um, I did a couple acoustic shows there. Uh, and um, I think it's the cultures, you know, I've always... Uh, uh, you know, Calvary Mouth went to France uh, two or three times. We did a couple of tours. We did uh, an extensive tour of France, where we went into uh, Switzerland and we went into uh, Italy a couple of times. Um, I, I just love, I love the culture. I love the difference in cultures. I just, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I just have wanderlust at this age of my life uh, that I was not able to afford touring. If we've been so busy. I, I really think maybe I'm making up for lost time. Hmm. Uh, just being in, uh, 
in bands my whole life, you know, since I was 19, um, your, your focus is dedicated on making that, that work. So you don't think of much else about traveling. And now that I've got a lot of extra time, um, I'm kind of just, like I said, making up for lost time. That's the way to put it. Mm -hmm. I've always loved, I've always wanted to go to you know, China, you know, I'm on the Great Wall and Kim goes, start singing the song. <laughs> I'll tell and I go, no. I, was like, I felt like my dad again. You're like, oh, yeah, come right. on. <laughs> Don't to me. So, yeah, but I sing a verse and a chorus and it's kind of funny. <laughs> you know, and you're walking up the Great Wall of the steps, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just that I, 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 we've been to some amazing places. I, I, um, I, I feel very, very lucky, you know. Um, I don't know what else to say. You know, we've got another, we got trips coming up all next year. We've already planned. Um, the thing of it is we do, we plan out a year in advance. Mm -hmm. This is where we're going to go here. Bang, bang, bang. And, uh, you know, of course, COVID put the kibosh on my Iceland trip in March. And uh, uh, there's just a lot of the world to see, man. It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't, we haven't even, I don't think we've even scraped the surface yet. Yeah. You know? Is there something in particular that draws you to a place uh, besides the fact that you haven't been there? So, uh, is there a common denominator? I can't. S well, okay. First of all, let me tell you, we just have a joke in our household. <laughs> and the joke is just, I, I don't have anything to do with the planning. So I stay up. <laughs> That's the, that's, yeah. that's the way it is. And we've struck a great balance here. <laughs> and so the thing of it is, is that I just, the joke is just show up. Hmm. Let's just show up, get on the plane and just go. And uh, I, 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 I don't really think about it too much. I just, I, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to Vietnam. Okay. You know, I'm going to Sri Lanka or I'm going to Maldives or I'm going to, Copenhagen this week, you know, I, it doesn't hit me really till I'm on the plane, I think. And I just, uh, just it, I go, okay, well, wow, we're, we're fixing to go to, uh, wherever, Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's been long overdue. Uh, you know, I really wanted to go to these places. There's still a lot, you know, I tried to adopt two kids from Russia back in 2000. And that was my first real big international uh, out of the country trip, uh, <clears throat> and um, so I went to I went to Russia twice during that year, two thousand two thousand one, and uh, unfortunately we did not get the kids, but that's another story. Um, yeah, and it's just, uh, my parents never did want to seem to ever have any like desire to go to the even Mexico or Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that their, their idea of going to Canada was, okay, we'll put one foot across at Niagara Falls and then pull it back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, okay, cool. You know, cool. My, you know, I think it also kind of stems from, from my parents, my dad, especially, you know, he was always a traveler, one of the good place. Whenever we lived somewhere, we were always, going out, branching out, going here. We'd go to spend a week in Joshua Tree in a camper. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd go up to the Redwoods, we'd go here, we'd go there. When we lived in New Jersey, we had to take a whole tour of the New England you know, circuit. You know, we went up Fort Ticonderoga and then New Hampshire, Vermont, over to Maine, you know, and, and all of the time we're hitting these historic sites. And uh, one of the things I think my dad instilled in me was this sense of historical uh, history. Hmm. Uh, should just say history because uh, he was a he was a big fan of just all kind of history and, and taught me a lot of stuff about um, and, and had me read a lot of stuff you know when I was growing up uh, different historical accounts of this and that and um, too bad back then you know I know we live in this age now where where we're trying to get rid of like you know white privilege out of books and this and that and whatever. Um, but uh and you know and, and howard zinn has put out his series of the people's version of the united states history they're mm -hmm. really great 
interesting takes, you know, on, on what really happened in the Vietnam. And going up, you know, with the Vietnam era, you're yeah. just, you're, you're like, you're just watching Walter Cronkite come on and David Brinkley and go, uh, 45 dead today and 600 wounded. And like, it doesn't really hit, it doesn't sink in. Yeah. You're, not a, you're not old enough to even go fight or, or even know that, you know, 18, you can vote or you, you can't drink liquor, but you can go kill somebody. Yeah. So all that sinks in later when you become an adult and you go, Oh, wow. I don't know history after all. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that when you go to these places, the historical, value that they hold and the old buildings and you know i mean standing inside the sistine chapel just she's like shit in your pants you know <laughs> have you ever been in there no i haven't i mean that's just let's just use that as an example you're standing in there and um you're thinking okay this guy laid on his back on a scaffold and painted the entire place mm. Uh, you just look just think about yourself put him, yourself in his shoes and imagine yourself I, i'm way too lazy yeah <laughs> i was paid in one stroke so i'm done <laughs> you know right but the, the the i think the historical i guess what i'm getting at here it what drives me and what pulls me in is the historical value of these places and when we do go to these places we try to hunt down or kind of join uh try to find something that has some kind of historical significance mm -hmm. and, and that's i think what really drives me to answer your question in a long way <laughs> but um you uh, recent i'll give you another example a recent uh, trip we made to vietnam we we had been going we'd been to the we've been to north vietnam a couple times already and when we went to south vietnam we uh we went to da nang and stayed there and, you know, you hear of these places, you know, you even hear, you know, when you watch an apocalypse now, yeah, you know, something you know, like, or, you know, platoon or whatever. And you're like, uh, you're like, hey, you know, we can't go to Da Nang. It's too hot right now. You know, whatever. Right. And you go to these places and you see it in a normal light. And it's like, wow, what the shit that went on here mm. in 1969 or something, whatever, you know, the 70s. Yeah. And, uh, and they're really nice people. Mm -hmm. And we go, we really screwed these people over, I feel. You know, you really go, what, why, what was really the purpose? You know, and uh, you start questioning those things from history in the books, the way they were told to you in high school. And, yeah. Yeah. So it was a great time uh, in Southern Vietnam, we went to these, uh, the Kochi trails, which is the underground tunnels that the North Vietnamese had dug to transfer troops and supplies and guns and weapons. And then went through these little, little tunnels that literally are as big as I am, that's, that there's no wall, that mm. this is, this is what you're crawling through this space. And you get to crawl through it for like 60 yards. And then you come up, pop up out of the jungle somewhere else. It's, 60 yards out in the jungle. Wow. It's, it's, it's really amazing. So that's why it draws me. I love stuff like that where you can actually participate. The other part of that whole trip was when we got to the end of that tour, it was a day tour we took. Uh, it took us to the Mekong Delta, and we got on a boat, and we went across the Delta, and we went to these little villages that are literally floating in the reeds hmm. and selling trinkets and stuff and house uh, homewares. And, um, and it just it's a you see these people and we have so many modern conveniences here in America and um, it just it really makes you think wow these I don't think I don't know if I could live like that you know if I was getting thrown, thrown into that situation yeah I would I would, I would it's a sink or swim you know I don't think I would swim you know, <laughs> sink because like hey where's my you know where's my cafe latte right. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, the other thing, yeah, that, so the historical value of these places, like being on the Great Wall of China, I mean, that's just, you, you're just sitting there going, wow, I can't believe I'm standing here once you're there. When you're going there, you're not thinking much about it. But once you're there and you're standing in it, and you're like, oh, my God, I never thought in a million years, if my mom and dad could see me at all, you know? 
stay yeah. out here. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember uh, my first trip or second, one of the second, first or second trip to Russia, to, to Moscow, and uh, a, a town called Chelyabinsk, which is way into the Ural Mountains. Uh, it's actually on the Asia Major part of the, the continent. Okay. Uh, we were standing in this little city and it rained for like a week and we couldn't get, leave our, our hotel room. And uh, it dried up and there was, you know, pools of water and they had big, you know, avenues with big sidewalk, big wide sidewalk. And I remember walking out of the hotel and uh, I looked down the fairway, down the sidewalk, and I saw an old gentleman in a suit, tie, a, a suit, just a suit. He got down on all fours and started lapping water out of one of the puddles in the sidewalk. Oh. I guess he was that thirsty. I don't, don't ask me why or whatever. Hmm. He was probably about 60 yards away. And I was like, wow, that's pretty desperate to for water if you've got to yeah. get oh and of course it's a very poor area poor country mm -hmm. um despite what any might think but uh, it didn't put perspective on my trip and yeah. i got home and after seeing what i've seen in the in the the, the, the i guess the um uh, the poorness of the country and, and the people and how they struggle uh, I came back and I like kissed the ground when I got off the plane. I was like, I'm not going to joke. I'm not, I, I, I don't think people in America really know how good they are. Mm. So they go to a place like that and they see how hard it is on the civilians. You know, it, it, it's really earth shattering. It will break your heart. But then you have to also remember, you know, we've got it. We take it for granted for it. I think in America for what we, we have and the access to what we have. Um, yeah. yeah. There's no place like it, you know, I guarantee it. I, I, I've been, you know, Australia comes in a close second, I guess, you know, kind of, they've got a nice society mm -hmm. going on. Got good, good people and um, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to say anymore. It's just really all, all I want to say. It's just I, I just feel really grateful that I've been and I've had that those realizations and epiphanies that make me who I am. You know, a, a kind of compassionate person. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it sounds like the the dose of perspective that you return with is is one of the great rewards of all these trips. You know, I guess you could say that, uh, along with the historical value of some of these places, is what draws you. 